this. Okay. All right. Welcome to the Planning and Land Use Management Committee. Been joined by the Honorable Co Council Member, I oh, made you a Congressman, <laughs> Paul Krikorian. <laughs> and um, my understanding is we anticipate Council Resar in a few minutes. Yes. In a few minutes, so, uh, <laughs> okay. So, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, when you come to the microphone, you could tell the acoustics aren't the best, right, Frank? It doesn't sound too clear. Um, but the acoustics aren't the best. So if you want to have a conversation, please take it outside so we can hear the speaker and hopefully the discussion. Um, when you come to the microphone, give us your name and address. And some of you might have written very eloquent letters, two, three, four pages long, but you have two minutes. So we want to focus on your letters and give us your statement so we can get to the point. That would be great. Um, the two minutes are right next to you. As you come up, look to your right. There's a clock there, so kind of time yourself. Uh, microphone, get a little bit closer. You don't have to touch it so that we can hear you. And uh, if the person before you has made a statement and they stole your thunder and you have nothing else to add, it's okay to say I agree with the previous person, but give us new information or different information to help us with the case. So that being said, we have a few items that I think we might be able to go through and uh, so we can get through the agenda as quick as possible. I believe in number one, we have a request. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll let Roberto read that to the record, but um, let me look at the items that we have on cards. On two, we have cards. <coughs> on number two, uh, I believe it's um, Alex Tucharve. Yeah, we're going to refer that to the department, but you're still welcome to speak if you like. What's a special? Okay. Oh, a lot more cards. All right. You're hiding them from me. <laughs> Okay, forget it. We'll make it special. Um, on three, we don't have any cards on three. Can we move to approve on that one, uh, council member? Okay, I'll come back to him. Four, we do have cards. So on three, we can move for approval. Do you have anything uh, there? So we can move, so moved, second. And um, number four, we're going to recommend uh, approval with changes by the district office. And that's okay, do you feel compelled to speak? Okay, so we can move that one with changes by the council office. Okay, and five and six, we can move on consent. See no cards. I have a second on that, Councilman. Okay. Seven. We have special. And eight will continue for thirty days. Nine will continue to November fifteenth. Hopefully, Council November thirtieth. Ten will continue for thirty days. And eleven, we do have the planning director here. Mr. Michael Legrand, Director of Planning. Good afternoon, Council Members. Michael Legrand for the record. Um, one thing I'd like to report, um, we had a very successful training program we conducted for area planning commissioners, as well as we had a few of our new citywide planning commissioners here. Over the years, we've heard that um, we need to provide a little more training and background for commissioners who, mostly on the area planning commissions, they hear appeals of legislative actions that are quasi-judicial, that don't come to the council, um, but basically usually stop at the first level appeal, which is the area planning commission. Things such as conditional use permits for wireless telecommunications, variances for yards, um, also conditional use permits for alcohol. 
many times is stop at these appeal boards. And so we provided a training for them that was very in-depth. Uh, it went over some basic planning principles, kind of a planning 101. We also had great participation from our city attorney's office um, in talking about the Brown Act and various legal issues regarding the land use decisions, as well as some issues of litigation we've had um, because of some decisions that have happened on appeals. We also dis discussed Robert's Rules of Order and different ways to conduct a meeting and making sure that the community feels like they're heard and they have a chance to speak. Um, similar to how you conduct your hearings here and try to pass along some of that sage advice that we've witnessed the council down to these other bodies that also hear planning and zoning issues. Um, went very well and uh, we also hand out copies of our um, recently um, worked on design guidelines so they could use those um, to encourage better designs when applications come before them. And it was a half day meeting and we are prepared to do this on a semi-annually or annual basis depending on how many new appointments we have. And who benefited from all this great material? Um, basically it was our appointed volunteer boards, the area planning commissions and our new citywide planning commissioners who were recently appointed by this body about a month ago. So it's like a boot camp for commissioners. Correct. Great, great. Um, I appreciate your hard work, and uh, hopefully they'll stay on as commissioners after that, right? Great. I think they will. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Mike. Anything to add, uh, Councilman? You know, on number four, I do have a card that's here. It's Portia Lee. And um, I want to make sure if you made the trip here, do you still like to speak on number four? We're fine. Yes, but I want to make sure I afforded you the opportunity if you so choose. Okay, thank you. I'm going to make the trip out here. I want to make sure it's worth your while. Thank you so much. So let's take care of number four. So, Roberto, where does that put us? Uh, back tonight, item one, Councilman, which is a communication from the mayor relative to a withdrawal for a commission nominee of the name of Steve Patel. Okay, so it's a uh, request for withdrawal, and we can move this to approve? Yes, to approve the withdrawal. Okay. okay. That'll be a second. That'll be action this committee. Uh, Next just item. to clarify, would that be to um, receive and file? Yeah, ultimately, you'll receive and file it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Next item? Uh, the next item, Councilman, is a motion of Rizar Koretz. Uh, it was a directive to the planning department to report with recommendations relative to a, the conversion of a senior retirement home to an adult residential facility in Boyle Heights. Out of courtesy to the council member, who I know he's on his way, uh, he's probably running down the flight of steps as we speak, should be entering. So we're going to hold this on the table okay. and we'll move to the next item. Next item would be item um, seven, which is a Cultural Heritage Commission recommendation to include the Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company Home Office uh, located at 1999 West Adams Boulevard in CB8 as a historic cultural monument. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Ken Bernstein with the Office of Historic Resources. Uh, this is the Historic Cultural Monument designation for Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company. The building was constructed in 1949 in the West Adams area. It's a six-story commercial building with character-defining features of the modern style. It was designed by the architect Paul R. Williams, who was the first African-American architect admitted to the American Institute of Architects. The Cultural Heritage Commission uh, made four findings, found that it met historic cultural monument criteria as it embodies the distinguishing characteristics of late modern style commercial architecture. Secondly, that it is associated with the master architect Paul R. Williams and that its lobby murals are a notable work of artists Hale Woodruff and Charles Alston. Third, that the building and the lobby murals reflect the broad cultural, economic, and social history of the community for its association with the history of African Americans in Los Angeles. The mural content histories reflect the work of noted librarian Miriam Matthews and historian Titan, Titus Alexander. And finally, the commission recommended designation of the property excluding the parking lot. Happy to uh, take any questions um, uh, following the public comment. Okay, we do have a card on this item, or a few cards. OK, 
Okay, so we have the we have Michael Weiss and Marcello Vavala. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Weiss. I represent the insurance commissioner as liquidator for Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company. The uh, liquidator opposes inclusion in the designation of the murals. Um, the murals, we submitted a letter which details our position. The murals are not the property of the building owner. The murals are separate property of the, um, of the insurance company and the insurance company owns those murals and those murals are to be liquidated and the money to be used to pay creditors. The creditors are your constituents in the 8th district. Um, they are people that invested in the company and now have obliga and now obligations are due to those creditors. So the, the, uh, the murals and the sale of those murals and eventual removal of the murals from the building will go to help pay those creditors. The uh, second reason the liquidator opposes is that the murals are not building fixtures. They're art that's removable from the building. And the third is to the extent that um, the designation somehow prevents the insurance commissioner from removing those murals, that would be a, um, a uh, that that event would be preempted by the insurance code because the insurance code provides that the insurance commissioner as liquidator is um, designated under the code to represent all interest and all assets of the insurance company. So to the extent you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Any questions, Council Member? Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marcello Zavala. Good afternoon, sir. Close. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Council Members. Marcello Vavala with the Los Angeles Conservancy. Uh, the LA Conservancy and its modern committee is the applicant for the nomination for the Golden State Mutual Building. And we authored this nomination because we wanted to ensure that this architecturally and culturally significant building uh, receives protection in the future. Uh, currently, the new owners are in support of the nomination. Uh, the, the local Cultural Heritage Commission voted unanimously to recommend designation. Uh, this is one of the few um, buildings that actually meets all four of the city's local landmark designation criteria we find to be very significant for the reasons Ken Bernstein mentioned. Uh, and also we do see a threat with the potential removal of the integrated murals which are site specific and reflect uh, um, the history of the African American experience in Los Angeles. So this building is very important. Uh, many in the local community are supporting its designation uh, and also uh, Council District 8 as well. So we ask that uh, the uh, Planning Land Use Management Committee uh, vote to recommend designation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Laura Myers, come on up. Good afternoon. I'm Laura Myers. I live at 1818 South Gramercy Place, and I am representing West Adams Heritage Association. Um, we specifically support not just the designation of the building, but also the designation of its pieces, its cases, its mural, its light fixture, all of the character defining features that are integral to the building. Um, and and he, the State Department of Insurance is correct. The stakeholders in this building are local community people um, who have lived in our community for, in some cases, 50 or 60 years, not as investors in the company so much as just pensioners. But they're in support of designating the murals and having them retained in the building even if it means there's a financial impact to them. Um, the murals were researched, meaning the history of the murals, the history that, uh, that created the content of the murals by another West Adams person back in the mid-40s, Miriam Matthews. Um, this city has named a library after her in honoring her history and his, the research she did into African-American history in this city. Um, this designating the murals as part of the building is completely consistent with every nomination I have personally ever brought forth to Plum where we list every character defining feature in a building on the outside, the inside, anything that's important. These are integral to the building. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Myers. Our next speaker, we've got two new cars. Marcos Velayos. Good afternoon, sir. 
Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Reyes and Honorable Council Members. Marcos Valaios with Park and Valaios on behalf of Community Impact Development to the owner of the property. Um, and we weren't going to speak today, but a couple of issues were brought up that we thought merited clarification. Um, one is we are in support of the application by the Conservancy. These murals, and I won't go into the history, which is well document in the report before you, but they are an integral part of this community. They're part of the historic fiber of the community um, and are an important part of this significant building. Um, Council for the Liquidator has brought up a couple of issues um, which are being disputed in the court currently. One is who actually owns those issues. Second is, is, is it a fixture or not? And third, would any action here be preempted by uh, the insurance code or any other uh, any other law um, and we believe we own them we're confident we will prevail in litigation but that's an issue for the courts um, so and, and similarly and we'll defer to the city attorney on this issue but counsel for the liquidator made an effort in that court case to prevent the city from moving forward with this application and the judge denied that motion and has indicated that the city can move forward with this process. So with all due respect, we would request that you approve the application. Um, this is a great thing for this site. It's a great thing for the community. And uh, we are here to answer any questions and, and respectfully request your support. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, may I ask, when was this uh, court hearing? How long ago was that? Um, it was about, it, it was a couple of months ago. Two months, okay. And the, okay. the effort, well, I don't want to put words into. Terry Coffin, Mesilla City Attorney's Office. It, it was a couple of months ago, and um, Mr. Weiss filed an ex party application to try and prevent the city from going forward with its monument designation proceedings, and Judge Jones denied that request. So um, it's not accurate to say the city's preempted. There's no court order um, preventing the city from going forward with its designation. There is a, a dispute going on, but she has not adjudicated um, that at this point. So, Okay, so we have the flexibility to make a decision today as a city, as a... Yes, you have a, an application pending before you, and the application um, describes what's covered. It includes the murals, and you need to look at the findings for what constitutes a monument and whether or not you think this particular application and um, you know meets the, um, the definition of a monument and then make your decision accordingly. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, last but not least, Dennis Rodriguez, representing the Council Officers Bernard Parks. Good afternoon. Uh, Dennis Rodriguez, Economic Development Deputy for Councilman Parks. Just want to say real quickly that uh, Councilmember Parks is in strong support of this uh, Cultural Heritage Commission uh, recommendation, and recommendation and the application by the Conservancy. Um, he believes very strongly that the murals are fixtures within the building. Um, and as you heard the comments a minute ago, uh, basically a fabric um, of that community and, and the great architect, uh, Paul Williams. So we ask for your support on this recommendation and application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. That concludes all the speaker cards that are on file. Um, any questions from the staff, Councilmember? You're pretty. Okay, please come on up, Mr. Bernstein. Um, I, I guess the first question I have is just to frame this a little bit. What, under both our Cultural Heritage Ordinance and the Historic Cultural Monument Exemption under CEQA, what, what is it, what are the limitations on what constitutes uh, something that can be designated a historical monument in terms of its uh, whether or not it's affixed to the building. What is the actual legal definition of that? Well, the language in the Cultural Heritage Ordinance actually refers to any site, building, or structure. Um, typically, our designations include the entirety of a property, including all of the features um, and 
fixtures that are that are included within a building or on the site. So typically the designation would apply to the entire property. In this case, there was discussion of that at the commission. The commission, Cultural Heritage Commission, made a determination to exclude the parking lot of, of this property, not to apply the designation to the entirety of the property, but to include the interior of the building, including the murals, with the finding that the murals were uh, themselves historically significant. They depict um, African American uh, history, relate to the institution, Golden State uh, Life Insurance, which was a, a significant institution in the African American if, community. If I can cut to the chase, though, the, I don't doubt the historical significance of them, but they must be a fixture of the building in order to be designated. Is that not right? I mean, you certainly couldn't designate the furniture inside the building or the, the rugs or, you know, something else that could be carried out of the building as part of the historical monument, could we? Well, again, it, typically it would, the designation would apply to the entirety of the building, and the under building. the Cultural Heritage Ordinance, the Cultural Heritage Commission and our staff would be reviewing any substantial alterations, any work that requires a permit, would be reviewed by the Cultural Heritage Commission um, and uh, you know, with the assistance of our staff. So in some cases, um, you know, that could include changes to fixtures of, of an interior of a building if it is work that requires a permit and could mean a substantial visible change to the building. Right. So the issue then boils down under ordinary real property concepts, whether or not this is a fixture and therefore a part of the building. Is that, is that right? Maybe well, I should ask I, the city attorney. Perhaps the city attorney that, should that, weigh that in. Question. Obviously, as, as was mentioned, there is a legal dispute over the status, uh, you know, whether this, these murals constitute a fixture. And I get that. Owns. I'm just trying to identify what the issue is first, and then we'll get to the, mm -hmm. the status oh. of it. So, so is that the issue, whether or not this is a fixture as it would be defined under ordinary uh, real property law concepts? I think so. I mean, that's the, that's the, um, it, you also have to look at the um, application itself. And so it, it is talking about the murals. The, the, I think um, Mr. Bernstein could explain further about how they're affixed to the building. Um, and that might give you a little bit better picture of what we're talking about. It's not, it's not a small, they're not small. Um, frames that are just, you know, tacked onto the wall with a picture hook, something of that nature. But um, right now there is a dispute over that issue. So um, and I'll the, get to that in a minute. Right, I, and but, the, but the court's aware of that. For purposes of our ordinance, also. though, this is what I'm trying to get at. For purposes of our ordinance and CEQA, a historical cultural monument designation is limited to the building, the site, the physical fixtures on that building. Is that correct? The language states site, building, or structure. Okay. That's, that's good enough for me. So, that, so if they are fixtures, they can be designated as part of the monument. If they are not fixtures, if they're personal property that are not affixed, then they cannot be. I think that's what I'm hearing. Is that, does anybody have a different understanding of the law? I actually haven't litigated that issue, but... I think that would be a common understanding, but I say that with a caveat that I okay. haven't researched it, and so you know I think it. it uh, I can't answer you more completely than that. I, I think it remains for another day to go further. And, and I'll get to that because it looks like that other day may be coming in this very case at some point. So if, if I can, then, Mr. Bernstein, next step in in the process. How exactly are these things, uh, these murals, affixed to the wall? Well, they are, in fact, affixed to the wall. However, uh, so they were not painted directly on the wall. They are canvas and were affixed to the wall. However, they were designed uh, for this space. They are significant uh, features of the lobby. There was space left, essentially kind of paint to suit, if you will, <coughs> Uh, that uh, these were murals that were designed in a site-specific manner to be in this location, these two locations, in this lobby. So while they are on canvas, <coughs> they were um, designed from the outset to be uh, in this space and to be significant features of this lobby. Uh, all right. Justin. Thank you. Uh, I think that that uh, is responsive. Thanks, Mr. Bernstein. And, and if I could ask um, counsel for the insurance company to come up for a moment, please, again. Yes. 
right, now, Michael you, Weiss. Uh, hi, Mr. Weiss. So you applied for a, either a TPO or a temporary restraining order or something ex parte? It's not correct. Okay, what did what, you apply what happened for? What was is the hearing that was? In um, September 30th of 2009, a conservation order was entered by the Los Angeles Superior Court, which prevents any adverse actions against the insurance, commit, against the insurance company. Then in um, January 28th of this year, another similar order was issued. So the city would need relief from that stay. They can't, they're the ones that came in on an ex parte application, which was granted so that with the, so that they, you could continue with this process. My point is that at the end of the day, if the murals cannot be removed from that building, that violates the insurance code. And at that point in time, um, there would be a conflict between the city's ordinance and the insurance code, and the insurance code would prevail. Okay, but for current purposes, there was an ex parte application. You, it was brought by the city it. for relief from the stay. Was that essentially, you know, may, and it, they can proceed? Excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry, Terry Copper, Messias City Attorney's Office. I, as I recall, um, the liquidator threatened action against the city and the city went in but the the bottom line is is that judge jones is, was very aware of the liquidator's position and the city's position had the um, the city's codes in front of her and was well aware of, of all of these issues and did not um issue any order preventing the city and to go forward with this designation and said she would not do that and in fact she hasn't and I, I just noticed although I hadn't seen it before um, that even now there's an order that was that she entered that said the these murals can't be removed from the lobby so it's pending it's just a there's pending no issue. dispute that it's pending um, the owner asserts that they own the murals and the commissioner says we own the murals um, okay so in your view if uh, historical uh, monument designation were granted by the city and then your litigation proceeds apace through the liquidation process um, and the court ultimately rules that this is a not a fixture b personal property of of the uh, of the debtor um, or see that there's preemption of this um, of this decision by the council, then what would be the consequences of that decision well, at the conclusion of that litigation? That's exactly what we'd like to get to. The bottom line is what you're asking. And the bottom line is we believe we get to remove those murals. So unless something can be shown that says at some point in time we can't remove those murals, we believe this is a waste of the limited assets of the insurance company, which or can be used to pay creditors instead. Sorry, but what I'm what I'm getting at is, let's suppose the city moves forward with the designation. Yes. <clears throat> Those murals are not going to be moved. They're still going to be there. At the conclusion of your litigation, you'll have every remedy then that you do right now as you're standing here, won't you? Y yes, except there will be less assets to pay to creditors, which are constituents and districts. No, if the court determines that these murals are your client's personal property, the murals will still be there at, when that decision is made by the court, right? So you will be in exactly the same position then as you are as you're standing here today. Isn't that right? As to Except the murals, that, yes. Yeah. As to the costs of this process, no. Every dollar that is incurred in this process by the insurance commissioner as liquidator comes right off the top of paying creditors. So to the extent you're talking about that the murals would still be an asset, yes. Um, to the extent that we're, we're using up resources that could be paid to, to creditors, the answer is no. Okay, um, thank Councilman, you. Councilman, yeah. um, one other issue, Terry Kaufman, Messiah City Attorney's Office. Um, if we get to that eventuality, we'd still have a role, the city would still have a role if, if the council designates this property to make sure that any um, change in the interior, any removal of these murals doesn't damage the uh, building itself so uh, we would want to make sure that we have experts we we do have experts in the office of historic resources to protect the the building itself I don't know that it's something that you can just lift these off and it's not going to damage walls or plaster or anything like that so 
that, that's still an outstanding issue as well. Right, and, and the mechanics of that would be right. something that the court, in its discretion, could oversee Absolutely. in trying to find a just result. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That was a robust discussion. Well, it, it, with all that, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm uh, comfortable with moving forward with this designation as it's been requested. And um, I think if there are outstanding issues dealing with the murals themselves, uh, those can be dealt with with the court and the the applicant or the insurance company has will have the remedies that it will need to address that um, at some point in the future, if and when the court should make that ruling. Okay. Um, just for the record, we've been joined by Councilman Bussar, um, but it, I believe you entered after public comment. Does that allow him to vote or not, just to be clear? Terry Koppel, Messiah City Attorney's Office. Uh, actually, if you're not here for public comment, then you can't vote, and I hate to do this to you, but, you know, we don't have abstention. If you're in the room, then it's a... Yeah, so if you wouldn't mind just leaving for a minute. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry Councilman. And then coming back. Thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll get you some water. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I just keeping the record clean and want to make sure we do things right. Um, so I will second the motion by Councilmember Krikorian, and that would be the action of this committee, Roberto? Uh, yes, Councilman. Okay. All right, so that concludes that item. And that brings us to item number two of the big drum roll. Which is uh, Councilman Luizar's uh, motion uh, as it relates to the conversion of a senior retirement home to an adult residential facility in Boyle Heights. That's pretty good exercise, wasn't it? <laughs> okay. All right, have the staff, please. Good afternoon, members of the committee, uh, Alan Bell, Planning Department staff. Um, here representing uh, the Chief Zoning uh, Administrator, uh, Lynn Wyatt, on this issue. Uh, what I can do uh, this afternoon is just provide uh, some factual information uh, concerning this case, uh, a chronology of the issues and what has transpired, and then what um, the options are uh, going forward. Um, Starting at the beginning, uh, in 1974, uh, the zoning administrator approved a use variance for a retirement home uh, for the aged uh, at the site, which is a Percy Village, uh, which is located uh, at 3455 uh, East Percy Street in the Boyle Heights uh, planning area. Uh, and this retirement home for the aged operated for uh, many years uh, uh, as such. And then in 2007, uh, there was a transfer of ownership and um, uh, Gateways Hospital uh, opened a adult residential facility uh, uh, providing uh, non-residential care and services for um, uh, mentally disabled adults. Um, there was an order to comply uh, issued by the Department of Building Safety alleging that this use uh, was a not a permitted use. And then the operator, uh, Gateways Hospital, uh, in response to that order to comply from the Department of Building and Safety, filed for a site-specific uh, zoning administrator's interpretation. And basically the issue addressed in that uh, zoning administrator's interpretation was whether uh, this particular use was a permitted use uh, as contemplated by the original use permit, which was granted in 1974. And then based upon uh, the facts of the case uh, and precedent and uh, the uh, findings that are set forth within the zoning code itself, uh, the chief zoning administrator found that a change of use uh, had not occurred. Uh, when it went from a retirement home for the agent to an adult residential facility uh, serving mentally disabled adults. Uh, the community, uh, there was an appeal of this uh, site-specific zoning administrator's interpretation to the East Los Angeles Area Planning Commission, and uh, the uh, Area Planning Commission upheld the determination of the chief zoning administrator. Um, 
furthering the chronology, uh, uh, the council under Charter Section 245 uh, issued its prerogatives. A motion was introduced to 245, uh, this particular action of the East LA Area Planning Commission. Um, I believe the city clerk can address uh, what happened after uh, this particular action of this commission of us 245. Uh, but suffice it to say, uh, the clock ran out on this particular action, and so therefore the determination of the Chief Zoning Administrator as upheld by the East LA Area Planning Commission was upheld. So that's kind of the background on, on this particular issue. Um, today, uh, uh, it is a permitted use of land under the city zoning regulations as authorized by the original use variance from 1974. Um, that original use of variance also included a very general condition which said that uh, the zoning administrator reserved the right to um, investigate uh, in allegations of um, non-compliance with the conditions uh, that are <coughs> excuse me that are attached to this particular site and basically uh, these can uh, basically there's a general condition that uh, uses have to be operated within due regard for the character of the community so based upon uh, that uh, general condition and um, information that was presented to the Office of Zoning Administration, um, an Associate Zoning Administrator held a comp condition compliance uh, review. And the Associate Zoning Administrator um, issued a determination uh, in, on uh, March 23rd, uh, 2003, a review of compliance with conditions. And based upon the public hearing that was held, uh, issued, uh, imposed additional conditions of compliance. Uh, two appeals were filed on the basis of that zoning administrator's determination. Uh, both of those appeals uh, will be heard by the East LA Area Planning Commission uh, tomorrow evening uh, as a matter of fact. Again, uh, this is an action of the East LA Area Planning Commission, so of course council has the authority under Charter Section 245 uh, to um, uh, substitute itself as, a, as the appellate body uh, for any action that may be engaged in with, with, uh, uh, by the East LA Area Planning Commission. Um, one of the things that is noteworthy about this particular uh, condition compliance is that the zoning administrator inserted an additional condition uh, for compliance and requiring that the operator file for a new plan approval condition compliance review within, I believe it's 12 to 15 months of this date. Uh, for an additional public hearing to ensure that the operator is operating in compliance with those conditions. So there will be a follow-up review, a follow-up investigation by the uh, planning department, and a further public hearing to determine whether or not the operator is complying with those new conditions. Also, just as a matter of record, uh, certainly uh, the planning department has the authority to uh, issue uh, admit, to initiate administrative nuisance abatement. There are procedures uh, outlined in section 1227.1 uh, of the zoning code relative to nuisance abatement. So certainly uh, authority rests with the city to initiate that should it rise to that particular level and there are sufficient evidence uh, to justify initiating that. And certainly the department could follow uh, the procedures established for initiating a nuisance abatement. So that's a recitation of the, and a chronology of the background and what, the, what, uh, uh, what we have to look forward to uh, in the future. And specifically, most salient, I think, is the future hearing within 12 uh, to 15 months uh, for condition compliance review. I Any questions? Of, I have a couple of questions. One is in terms of process, uh, how many... Uh, how many times did the community get to engage the commission as it was going through its deliberations? How many meetings did occur in the discussion of this issue? Well, for site-specific zoning administrator interpretations, uh, that's an administrative uh, measure. Uh, no hearing uh, is required. The appeal before the APC, uh, there was a hearing and it was noticed and there was quite a, a, an attendance on both sides of the issue in terms of whether to uphold or to uh, um, uh, grant the appeal of the APC of the Chief Zoning Administrator's determination on that particular matter. So it was a, it was a lengthy hearing. 
Um, many attendees, many, much testimony was provided at that particular hearing, both from the operator and then also from members of the community. And then the hearing that was held on condition compliance review, I'm sure it was a very well attended hearing. Uh, again, operators and representatives from Gateways Hospital attended that particular hearing and then also members of the community attended that hearing. So, so two hearings have been held to date uh, on this particular issue one under the appeal before the APC and then also by the uh, administrator, uh, Sue Chang. Okay. Then, um, any questions? Are we going with the public comment? Yeah, public, public comment first. Okay. So, we have here, and I'm not sure how to read this, I think it's Michael or Michelle Condors. It's at 2000 Riverside Drive. That's Gonzalez? <laughs> oh, man. You must be a doctor. <laughs> Actually, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, members of the uh, council and residents, thank you for th this opportunity. Um, before I make my comments, I would like to address a couple of statements made by staff that I think um, may have been in, order, uh, um, in error. First of all, I believe that the owner took over this property in 2005 and um, shared the facility with the remaining residents of the Malacan home there for a period of almost two years before it was converted completely to an adult care facility. And one of the other things I'd like to just bring to the attention of, of the committee is that... Mr. Gonzalez, just yes. for sake of clarity, when you say take over when the owner entered the building, how was it used at that time? Um, it is my understanding that when the current owner of the facility bought the property, it was prior to the complete conversion to an adult uh, residential facility which took place in 2007. I believe that the initial purchase was 2005 and that there were still residents, senior uh, residents, residents left over from the days of its operation by the Malacan Church. So we had a mixed population. Yes, a mixed population. And actually, if you look at the uh, crime reports that uh, that had been filed with the zoning administrator's paperwork on the appeals that were uh, mentioned, you'll see that the spikes in uh, criminal activity started occurring in the 2006 year after the 2005 turnover, um, with the numbers growing increasingly higher through to 2010 when this particular hearing took place. Um, that's, that's one thing. Second, I'd just like to bring to your attention the fact that when the building and safety investigators went to this property pursuant to uh, the certificate of occupancy uh, review that was done, they were under the impression that this was a, a mental health care facility for, for uh, adults and that a hospital was being run as opposed to a residential care facility. Um, and that's important from the way the community looks at it because from our perspective, the apples to apples comparison that was made by the zoning administrator when they looked at um, what was supposed to have been taking place there, which is how it was described by the, uh, by the owner and operator, as opposed to what was being observed by city staff and the residents, there was a, a big miscommunication because it seems to us like a lot more is going on than simply a residential care facility. Okay. We feel that medications are being dispensed there, that counseling sessions are being dispensed there, and that it falls more under the definition of a hospital as opposed to a residential facility. So, I'm going to a few because of my question, but that concludes the two minutes, and I'll go to the next speaker. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll make this very, very brief. One of the biggest concerns is that the community has been attempting to uh, establish a dialogue with the owner and operator of this facility since 2005, and those attempts have fallen on deaf, ear, deaf ears until this issue came up with the um, zoning administrator's hearing. And what we would really hope for is the opportunity for a full-blown um, process. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Council. Father John, Father John Lada. No, his writing is good. I just mispronounced it. <laughs> Father John. Gentlemen, um, I've been there 28 years in my parish this month, as a matter of fact. I came there as a very, very young priest. 
But this is an issue that is not going away, uh, and we really uh, come to you because we haven't had until now really an opportunity to voice our opinion to the, uh, on behalf of the community. Um, they they want to put 134 uh, um, uh, patients in that facility. Now, under in no stretch of the imagination can you say that these people are considered the same as adult senior citizens that were there for the, the Malikan administration through so many years. We traced down the amount of police calls. Uh, the peak year recently was 271 police calls. You multiply that times uh, $1,200. You multiply the, the calls for service from the fire department. That's another, uh, we estimate that at $2,200. It comes to like in one year, $440,000 of the, the taxpayer's money. That's just a, a ballpark estimate. That doesn't include the other ones that have no record of. Those are the ones that are of record. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a, a, an issue that we're happy to see uh, uh, the councilman uh, bringing this forward so that uh, the, whatever the, 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 um, the planning commission tomorrow is going to decide is going to come back to your authority. So we're very grateful for that. We support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Alejandro Hernandez. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm not used to coming places like this and speaking before people, but um, I felt my opinion had to be heard. Um, I'm a resident there for over 25 years. Um, since since these people moved in, or since the, they they brought on the mentally ill people, I've noticed the neighborhood has been deteriorating. So definitely, we are in support of the the motion by Miss Mr. Wizar. Um, my kids. Uh, the area over there is like um, uh, Whittier and Lorena. Right there, there's bus stops, and there's a lot of commercial areas there. My kids take the bus. They take the, the rapid transit there on that intersection. They're constantly being harassed by, by you know, panhandlers, and, and we know where they come from. You know, we know that they belong to, to the Percy Village. Um, you know, the Percy Village. Um, from what my understanding is that they're supposed to be supervised and n never do we see them supervised. They're out on the street, they're, you know, um, we know that they belong to the village. So if you could uh, understand how our quality of life in the neighborhood has r diminished since they've been there. Um, and the, I know that we've spoken, we've also spoken to the to the neighborhood businesses, the businesses that they have people out on out, out in the street panhandling const, constantly. Um, and they they're walking up and out, up around the streets, you know, almost on a on a daily basis from sunrise to sunset. I know that they have limitations on what hours they're supposed to be on, and those guidelines are not followed. Uh, we don't know if they're supervised within the building. Um, we know that that um, the crime has gone up and you know we've documented I think you have, you have our reports reports of that so um, I I hope that you support the the motion Mr. Nunez, um, when you say you, you know the crime from Percy Village you make that statement is it because you recognize a person panhandling and you recognize that same person who lives in Percy Village can you say that no, no, sir. You know, we've 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 had communications with the people from the from the merchants that have their stores there, and you know they've actually photographed the people caught shoplifting, and so that's how we make the so the, it's the, the information. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I mean, these people come into the stores and and they've come, they caught shoplifting, and well, the, well, let me make it more direct. Do you know if that's the person? Do I know? Yeah. Um, um, yes, I do. Okay. Yes, okay. okay. I just yes, want to be clear. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, excuse me, Council Member Reyes, Terry Kaufman, Masia City Attorney's Office. So I just want to be clear because this is kind of a line here with your your motion. This isn't a hearing on nuisance abatement proceedings and conditions and whether or not they're violations and so forth. At the end of the day. Um, the motion is to instruct the planning department to come back with recommendations. So it does relate to community concerns, and you're hearing those concerns, but again, it's a fine line b between hearing them and then crossing over into some kind of a, an abatement proceeding. So I just well, want to... I appreciate that the rationale for my question is to understand the environment we're in. John Ball? 
afternoon. My name is John Ball from uh, Lorena Pharmacy. We're a business right there close, and we've been open since 1928. And uh, I've seen a big change in the neighborhood, and we've had a bit. We're one of the businesses they're talking about uh, shoplifter problems, and we know for a fact those people are from Percy Village. They tell us that police pick them up and get their address, and we we've logged quite a few calls over the last few years, but uh, we don't log most of them because it's pointless. You know, the the police take a long time to come. We have to hold the guys. We caught one guy in our doorway, and as he tried to escape with a wheelchair, and his pants fell off in the doorway. All our customers sitting there, you know, while our security guards trying to secure him. I mean, it's embarrassing for I'm sure the you know the patients and for us. Um, we also have some apartments across the street, and the Percy people go up to the windows in the apartment, stand at the window, and knock on the, on the tenants' windows. The tenants are freaked out. Uh, right up the street, there's a library where little children walk up the street. Again, they, and, and, you know, the Percy Village wants us to prove that they are Percy people. Okay, so maybe some of them aren't, but most of them are. They aren't carrying bags. They don't have shopping carts. I mean, these people are, and we know who they are. We're there every day of the week, and we know where they come from. And uh, so just from our perspective, it's just been difficult having, having the facility open with this type of patient. And, you know, patients before the Senior Citizen Center, there were no complaints, there were no problems. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, sir. Maria E. Duran. And then we'll have Christine Rodriguez. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I come in here where I support the motion of Conservative uh, Jose Wister um, because I saw, saw a lot of times in the street the people, the Percivillas, is uh, selling and buying drugs and alcohol. Okay, at 8.30 at night in the morning, they asking not for money, they asking for abuse. And what I know is the Percivillas people, because they have a, a carnet, the three times I saw, they had carnet, the Percivillas and her name. And the other times, is it school times when the people come in, when the parents with the kids go to the school, because it's a residential and a school son, they sell the drugs. And I love my community. I live in, in this community for 14 years. I'm homeowner. I have my uh, granddaughters. And um, for me, it's insane for them. This way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Christine Rodriguez. After Ms. Rodriguez, we have Frank Villalobos. Good afternoon. My name is Christina Rodriguez, and I support the motion. Thank you. Wow, great. <laughs> All right, Frank, can you beat that? <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. That was three words. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for five minutes because that's what it says in, the, in, your, in your guidelines, but I'm going to honor your request for two minutes. Um, I'm Frank Villalobos, and I'm a consultant to the Mothers of East L.A. in many cases. Over the last 30 years, it started with a prison fight. Uh, you know, back in the days of the state wanting to build a prison in East Los Angeles. And since then, I have graduated to other projects. And this is one that is very difficult for me to deal with, in particular because I have 40 years of planning experience in the city of Los Angeles. And so I brought you uh, two uh, items. One is the RD 1.5 ordinance, and the other one is the C2 ordinance. This is from your own books for the city attorney to follow up. What it says basically is that you're not allowed to put in a mental clinic facility in an RD 1.5. And if you are going to ask for a conditional use permit, you have to use the C2 zone to do so. Basically, uh, I have to disagree with the zoning administrator's interpretation of the code because she erred. She erred in many ways. One, they took in the application through Garcetti's office originally. And so the general public was not allowed to have a public hearing because it was held in Silver Lake. Secondly, when the notice of the zoning administrator went out, it goes to the adjacent property owners by procedure. Uh, it just so happens that Percy Village owns 
several lots, including the two adjacent properties. And so the addresses that those notices went to were to Percy Village, and therefore the community was then left out. The last one, I mean, I have a copy of the 245 here, because it was public document right off the bat. But even that document sort of got lost through the process. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, letting us to believe that the process has somewhat, you know, been altered. Uh, some people are wondering whether or not it's close to a mockery. And so what I want to say is that, in my opinion, this people that I work for have an opportunity to come and tell you what they feel, and that there should be a process, and that it should be a legal process. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to our Councilman Wiesar, and to you, and also to the Councilman, because this is the right you know, place to be. And so we hope to come back <laughs> and tell you the right stories at later. Thank you, Mr. Villalobos. Sylvia Duarte and Juan Manuel Duran. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Sylvia Duarte. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm in support of the motion. I'm not even going to go into details because everybody is saying the same thing I want to say, but they don't live on my street. And I can go into details, but I don't have enough time. But I am in support of the motion. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for your succinctness. Juan Manuel Duran. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. I live in this area for 26 years, but three blocks away from the Percy Street. And uh, since uh, these people came to our community, there uh, we can see a lot of change on the community because uh, we can saw these people. I saw them. 6 o'clock in the morning to 8, 8.30 on the night. They, uh, one time I saw one of them to the Chinese food. They asking for, for money. And uh, the man he said, wait, I want pay first and then I give you money. This man gave the change, so it was less than 50 cents. And he was mad. He said, no, I want a dollar. I know one change. I want a dollar. And uh, I know all the people, we are afraid to these people come close to us because we never know what they will do. Okay. And I support uh, Jose Wizar. Uh, I forgot my English. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Thank you. Teresa Marquez, and then Alex Tusarbu. I'm sorry, I apologize. Good afternoon. My name is Teresa Marquez. I live in Boyle Heights. And I'm president of the Boyle Heights, Boyle Heights Stakeholders Association, which we, our mission is quality of life, to improve the quality of life in our community. And this has a very important issue here. Basically, I don't want to keep uh, repeating things, but think about living in your community. It's a res strictly residential. All of a sudden, they put in a rehab. And you, first you think it's a senior housing, that's going to be okay. Then they, all of a sudden, they turn it, you have strange people walking in and out, and all new people. They rehab for alcohol, drug, and mental patients living right next to you, right next door. And they're wandering the streets. They're wandering your streets. Uh, we have a library half a block away, which I attend all the time. And then um, middle school, a block and a half away, besides having a grocery store for families there. And these people are all over uh, the place and they have no supervision whatsoever during the day. And sometimes they're even out at night, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. The worst part about Boyle and Boyle Heights is the use of our government services, our police department, our fire department, our paramedics. And right now, as you know, we got furloughs, we got cuts because of the crisis. With these people, we, they use our services overwhelming. 
taking away our regular services. And it's not fair. And it's definitely not fair to the property owners there to have this. They can rent their apartments if they have a, an extra house. The, you wouldn't want to go to somebody's house for a party or a dinner that has mental and drug uh, uh, patients there. Thank that you, are Marcus. Wondering. Thank so, you very much. Thank you. Our last speaker is Alex de Carve. Hi, I'm Alex Ticciarone. I'm the managing partner for Percy Village LLC. We own and operate Percy Village, as well as 1,800 other apartment buildings in the city of Los Angeles, as well as two assisted care facilities buildings in Northern California and Las Vegas, addressing high-risk people. We also co-own a home building and development company that builds both in California, Nevada, Hawaii, and San Felipe, Mexico. I am in support of what Mr. Bell has recommended as far as um, the, the zoning approval. Uh, it's our policy to continue adhering to whatever the city attorney and the um, planning commissions want us to do. Um, as far as police reports and police issues, we have documented police reports which indicate a strong decline in police calls to Percy Village. Historically, the police calls were not directed to that site. They were general calls to the general area. We have procedures in place and policies in place right now which monitor the, the clients. We will address those issues tomorrow night at the next commission hearing. Our intention is to follow the law, and we will continue to follow the law. Thank you. Any questions? Not at this time. Any questions, colleagues? Okay. Council Mayor? Okay. Well, thank you very much, and I want to thank all the community members who came out um, to speak on this matter, and it is an issue that we often hear about in this part of Boyle Heights, uh, and it's been going on for quite some time. Many residents often bring up, bring to my attention that this facility um, has had many issues with some of the residents uh, um, causing nuisances in the neighborhood. They increase calls to police uh, to uh, the site. And uh, when we attempted to hear the matter through the normal procedures, um, the file, and we heard it through the appeal process, and the final appeal will be a section 245 here, uh, the, the file was somehow lost uh, in the clerk's office. But the intent of this motion was to ask our planning department, given all the different hearings that are going on, um, the different manners, uh, the different ways in which we could address some of these nuisances, what is your best thinking and advice to this council in terms of addressing the um, community's concerns? But before we do that, let me first ask the city clerk, I think there's a representative from city clerk here, um, on our section 245 issue, what exactly happened there? Why couldn't we hear it in Plum? Uh, you know, we, I put in the Section 245 motion. There's a timeline or, uh, before that expires, and we were surprised to hear that the timeline had been expired and Plum had not been notified. Can you explain to us what happened there? Holly Walcott, Executive Officer, Office of the City Clerk. Basically, it was a perfect storm. Um, as you stated, you did uh, introduce the um, 245 motion and it was adopted. Um, generally when regular motions are adopted they go into the file and that's what happened. It went straight to the file instead of being given to the Plum Committee clerk. The other thing that happened is I understand the staff that's no longer with you, the your planning deputy f simply failed to follow up. Mm -hmm. So both those things, the file went to the wrong division and and staff that should are responsible for Scheduling. Scheduling. It failed. just didn't happen. Okay. And so um, we just needed a public explanation on that so that, so that we could um, be aware of what happened. So thank you. We have taken steps to make sure that that does not happen again by changing our procedures. Okay. Thank you very much. Does it happen often? First time. First time. Okay. Um, and so the, the intent of this motion was we missed that opportunity to discuss the change of use and whether that was proper. The zoning administrator decided it was proper. 
Um, but that's why appeals procedures are in place to hear different points of view. We have an attorney for the local community that sees it differently. Um, we may have saw it differently after hearing the item before prom and before council. Um, we didn't have that opportunity. Uh, there's a hearing tomorrow in the East Area Planning Commission on the conditions. Uh, we've also raised issues of um, perhaps beginning uses, abatement proceedings. Um, we, through this motion, wanted to give the community an opportunity to see what those various options are. I know my staff, in talking to the department and others, we have ideas, but if we could put the full weight of POM and of council to ask the department to come back and lay that out for us. I think the community could see where we are and, and how to continue to proceed so that the community uh, feels it has been, uh, uh, these issues have been addressed and the issues have not been ignored. One thing that I do find kind of interesting is that, in fact, when um, this Percy Village applied for some funding through the city, it was done through Council District 13 through Mr. Garcetti's office. And I found it quite interesting that we continue to have an administrator of errors uh, when it comes to this site and we, uh, are, the public is not given a proper opportunity to address those issues. Um, so I just want to make sure that as we proceed, it's done in a very transparent, open process through this motion so that we see it go step by step and that the community feels that every opportunity for them of course, balancing the rights that the owner has, um, are, are that they, they are given that opportunity to express themselves. So with that, the planning department, I was hoping we could get a report back in 30 days, uh, a written report. I know you could probably give us a verbal report today, but a, a written report to the committee uh, on, on this so that we could have that in, in writing. Uh, we'd be happy to follow with a, a written report, but I can tell you what our recommendation is, which sure. is to... Uh, follow the existing process uh, that we launched back with the public hearing uh, in November to review whether or not the facility was operating with the conditions, the general condition that it be operated with due regard to the character of the neighborhood, uh, which is a general condition that we have for all of our uh, zoning administrator approvals from 1974. Uh, so we did that. Uh, the zoning administrator issued a determination and imposed 31 conditions of approval. Uh, one of those conditions uh, is to come back uh, to uh, the department uh, with a report on compliance with those 31 conditions. A new public hearing will be held. We will send an investigator out to determine whether uh, compliance is proceeding as outlined within that. So I think we have uh, a good process. We've launched that process. I think that, that the new conditions are appropriate and balance the rights of the community. Uh, with the operator. Uh, I note that we have appeals from the community. We also have an appeal from the operator. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have different points of view on this particular issue. So, so our recommendation is, is to let this process um, move forward. If there is continued progress, uh, has been reported, uh, that's a good thing. And uh, we'll find out with our new hearing uh, within one year in terms of whether we've had further progress in terms of, of these conditions. Generally speaking, when it comes to, to nuisance abatement, um, our objective is to uh, gain compliance uh, with conditions. Uh, it, nuisance abatement is, is it's always a kind of a, a last uh, resort. Uh, we want to use that process uh, in a way that uh, we're going to get improvement in the operations, not necessarily to, to shut down a facility or a business, but to get improvement in that because it does no good for the city to have a shuttered facility. Um, so it's worked in the past. I am very confident that it will uh, work. Uh, I think that, that our procedures are, are, are good ones and that I think that we will see a turning point uh, with, with the conditions that uh, the Office of Zoning Administration has laid out, very detailed uh, compliance conditions. Okay, thank you. So we'll, we'll proceed with those, with the hearing, we'll proceed with the uh, appeal tomorrow, we'll proceed to uh, possible nuisance abatement actions. In the meantime, if you could uh, outline all that again for us uh, in writing uh, to this committee, if that's okay yes. with you, Mr. Chair, I just feel that um, this issue has gone to the point where we really need to just be very clear about where we are as a city. 
uh, some of the residents have lost confidence in our procedures because the way we've handled the issue. So we want to make sure that we're have that in writing, know the different options, know where we are, get a hearing in this committee so that we know how, how we're proceeding with the matter. Okay. We'd be happy to put that in writing. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor, I do have a, just a couple of general questions and I'm referring to how we typically behave in these situations in terms of uh, enforcement and just in general is is enforcement monitored by a state agency or is it a local agency how, how does that work uh, this is a, a state licensed facility department of uh, social services at the state level licenses these facilities I'm sure that they have their own protocol for inspection and monitoring of compliance with with state conditions but would it be appropriate um, to get their report as part of the background of this case? That, would that be appropriate? Certainly we can ask them if, if, if they have any information that they want to share uh, with the city relative to this operator. Uh, we can certainly ask them to share that information uh, with us. So uh, we will do that. Yeah. Um, but as far as conditions, it's, uh, Building and Safety is the, is the agency that uh, enforces planning and post conditions for use variances or conditional use permits. You know, it goes without saying that, that we don't have enough staff uh, right. at the building and safety to, to enforce. Enforcement is typically complaint driven. We don't have proactive code enforcement. Right. But we're hearing, I mean, just given what I heard today, there seems to be two levels of issues. One is the discretion we exercise as a municipal corporation and dealing with the implementation of zoning laws as administered by building and safety and then you have the quality of service and program management that has a byproduct impact as described by the constituents in the surrounding area of how the population is or is not being managed right and so that is a county or state uh, area of concern and we have ours well, we imposed uh, very specific conditions relative to the operations of the facility, and we have the authority to impose those kinds of conditions. Uh, so, for example, there are um, conditions in here that are uh, relative to supervision uh, of the residents of the facility. I see. Um, uh, conditions relative to, to, to curfews and, 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 and when they cannot be, when they have to report back to the facility. So I think that those are appropriate conditions that are not in conflict with state law, and I think that we have authority, since it is operating under a, a use variance, uh, to impose those particular okay. conditions. I think one last point is just the, the clarification in terms of what's allowed and what's not allowed in particular zones, in terms of where this is situated. I have to answer that now, but uh, I think Mr. Villalobos brought up the issue of interpretation of how it's being defined and whether it qualifies or not. I, I, hopefully we can get that in the report as well. Uh, well um, in terms of the interpretation, the zoning administrator's interpretation of this particular use, right? Uh, we often get applications for uh, uh, site-specific interpretations, uh, matters of whether or not a use is permitted uh, within the code. And basically there's a, a, a two-part test for, for uses that are not specifically enumerated in the code but whether or not they are permitted. But I did, I'm just asking we can put that as part of the, make, make sure that's part of the report. Sure, we'd be okay. happy to do that. Great, Mr. Bell. Any more questions? Yeah. All right. Back uh, in 30 days, right? 30, 30 days? days with a written report? 30 days. Yeah, that's okay, fine. report back in 30 days. And that'll be the action of this committee. Thank you, Mr. Bell. I want thank to thank you. the committee for coming here today. Um, anything else, Roberto? Uh, public comment. Anybody here for public comment? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned. Thanks, Mr. Rea.